Welcome to Big Blue Ideas, where we turn up, speak out, and dive in. And we are tonight going deep. This is Who Owns the Ocean, where we take a look at marine protected areas and we explore power and the future of our seas. Now, what is a marine protected area? A marine protected area, some are strict no-take or sanctuary zones where we put pause on people and the ocean, where we have no mining, no fishing. We say, you cannot ride a jet ski here. And some, these are places where the rules are more like gentle recommendations, where we think, you know, maybe we don't know what we can do. So we're gonna start with this point. If we let it, the oceans can recover. They can bounce back. Marine protected areas boost fish populate populations, they spark habitat recovery, and they even support fishing. So why are we talking about this now? Because marine protected areas are 2025's it girl. They're about to take center stage at the United Nations Ocean Conference in France, where they will be a key part of the new High Seas Treaty. Because they are in the news like the recent opening of one of the world's biggest marine reserves to commercial fishing. They are, in David Attenborough, global granddad and nature whisperers, 99th birthday gift to the world, his documentary, Ocean, where he says to us that marine protected areas are one of the biggest solutions to the ocean's problems. There are no easy answers. This is where we all join together to imagine an ocean future that works for everyone. All right, so now we are going to meet our panelists. Can the panelists please come up on stage? Thank you. Grab a drink of water. Camille, this is, this is your area of expertise. So let's talk 30 by 30. What is it? Um, all right. Look, ocean biodiversity is declining uh, at a faster rate than it ever has in human history. And 30 by 30 is basically the acknowledgement that we need to protect 30% of the oceans by 2030 if we want to save ocean biodiversity for future generations. Fantastic. And the High Seas Treaty? The High Seas Treaty is a landmark opportunity, actually once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for us to be able to protect those the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction and um, it will enable us well it's basically a mechanism to implement high seas mpas at scale so that we can reach that global 30 by 30 target because we will not unless we protect the high seas dave how do we measure whether an, a marine protected area or i might say mpa which is like shorthand and a lot easier is truly effective in protecting marine biodiversity, the critters. <laughs> the critters. Well, you mentioned earlier no-take marine reserves as the gold standard. And incidentally, some fishers think no-take means catch and release. So maybe that's not such a good expression, but what we mean is no fish removed and even replaced. Uh, and that's been shown in Australia and overseas to be critical to make a difference. Um, I will say the 30 by 30 is a little bit concerning because people think if you put a marine park border around the area, uh, it's fine. You can still catch fish. Um, and, and, and that's just not the case. And in fact, even our uh, uh, ex-environment minister, Tanya Plibersek, who's you know, done a great job overall in many ways, um, was... Uh, was uh, said that we've already reached it already because she wasn't aware that most of this protected area was not no-take. Uh, not practically, yeah, practically worthless unless it's no-take. That's, that's a really good point, that there are so many different types of marine protected areas. There's reserves, and what really matters is these sanctuary or no-take zones. Now, Robert, what are some specific opportunities or challenges for Indigenous peoples in the creation of, of no-take zones? Well, for, for us, there's, there's opportunities to work with some of our partners and learn um, about the, science, the Western science of, of what's going on there and, and merge that with some of our living history. We've had to evolve a little bit because the, time, the times have changed. 
And I think we've had to, you know, um, for us teaching, you know, these areas give you know, us an opportunity if they're, um, you know, highly productive areas and that to talk about the creatures that are special to us because we do have some marine species that we think are almost things like pippies that are culturally significant food source that we haven't touched in Sydney for maybe the 70s, you know, because, you know, we want to be able to keep those stories and the benefits of those stories, you know. There's some things like that all I teach even my some, some of my young rangers, what are they? Because they don't know what they are and they're a, a culturally significant source of food but also stories so those stories and that are lost so for us keeping things like that alive and around enables us to continue those stories keeps everything alive doesn't it i like your words be brave we all need to be brave mm. all right. now julia you understand challenges and that they cannot be a reason for inaction what do you think are the greatest challenges for the public in understanding these big issues and how do we overcome them well, I mean, the challenge is to weigh up a sense of concern with, with what we feel to be impotence and to recognise that action is still possible and it's, we're still able to do things. I think there's just a sense of overwhelm right now and the racing of time, and that is true. We are really up against it. Um, and I think I just – so many people who work in this area have to deal with a sense of, you know, deep concern – wondering why people aren't changing their behaviour more, what do you do with despair? But then I also think of Tim Winton who, when he was talking about his, his book Juice, just kept saying, who profits from our despair? Who benefits from that when we give up on this, on this whole charade? So the challenge is to encourage people to think that it's just it's not out there, it's kind of right next to you and – it matters and it's not beyond us to do something about it. Excellent. I love that. Who profits from your despair? Mm -hmm. I don't want anybody to profit from my despair. They do, right? You're absolutely yeah. right. Now, um, we're going to open it up to one question from the audience, if anybody has one. One per section. We have a question right here in the front row and we have a microphone coming to you. We'll just do one per, sec per question and then a bunch at the end. Hi. My question is for Camille. I was wondering how are we going to monitor the high seas treaty and, and protected areas in the high seas because that's a big area to monitor. So are there any plans for that? That's an excellent question. Um, I think as a global community we are all working on that at the moment because monitoring and surveillance at that scale is going to be – a very big challenge. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Um, it will also it will also require significant amount of resourcing. Uh, so, how we're going to monitor it? I mean, basically, the way we monitor marine protected areas within national jurisdiction now, but at scale. So, yeah, it is the wild, wild west out there, and we will. Sorry. No, no, yeah. no, I'm just nodding along with you. That's yeah. great. But yeah. significant amount of resources yeah. will need to go into figuring out, you know, like there will be scientific and technical groups that are forming at the moment while politicians and there is this political momentum rallying for ratification, but we are figuring that out as a global community. Like how do you how do you monitor at scale you? like that? Yeah. And Dave, I know he's he's on the Prince William's Earthshot Prize panel, so he knows all about <coughs> technological innovation. Oh, there's some amazing technology, nothing to do with that, but um, the law abiding uh, boats have a vessel monitoring system on them, which which um, they can then be seen to be transgressing the boundaries of, of marine parks. But I, I think the things like the, the Google Maps initiative where you can monitor world fishing boats and turning behaviour, a fishing boat fishing turns or it doesn't turn a lot more or something, so there's algorithms to sort of work out who the naughty people are and, and enforce it that way. So some pretty good technology um, out there. Scientists and conservationists say that the creation of more marine protected areas, no take zones, in the high seas are a win-win for everyone. But I remember when the Macquarie Island Park was expanded and the commercial fishing industry was not very happy about it, right? So, at the beginning. So, on the other hand, I've heard that the commercial fishing industry in Australia is actually pretty good at following the rules and that there are a lot of rules. So that where one of the big problems is, is with 
recreational fishers, which is not something that a lot of us often think about. So Dave, what do you think? Please explain. <laughs> Uh, I will say that uh, I don't quite agree with you about commercial fishers. Yeah, please explain um, it yeah, all. Yeah, I, I won't explain because <laughs> – <laughs> no. uh, but the Macquarie Island uh, situation yeah. was interesting. Again, a big marine park, um, the Environment Minister claimed it. But when you look, only about 10 to 12 percent was actually no take. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, like I was saying before, what's – you know, is, is it as valuable as we think? Um, but flipping to wreck fishes, and, and you know, honestly, wreck, wreck fishing is a wonderful pastime. The eyes of the sea, you know, many times wreck fishes will point out problems in the ocean. Yeah. But, but yeah, the, the idea that they're not having an impact, it's like the death by a thousand cuts idea. And, and they certainly do. And we can easily see that by having a well enforced marine park and watching the, the fish come back and uh, large fish and that sort of thing. So, you know, there's no other explanation than, than fishing has an effect on fish. Surprise, surprise. Thank you very much. All right, Robert, as the son of a fisherman, rebuttal, no, <laughs> as the son of a fisherman, seafood was the main source of subsistence for your big family growing up. And the water around botany is fertile and the ocean could be your supermarket. So how do you think we can balance fishing with conservation? Um, botany based, still fertile. I'd, I'd argue that, it, that it's probably not <laughs> um, because I think, me, yeah, son of a fisherman, yeah. the youngest of 12 children, we heavily relied, relied on the ocean. My father uh, was basically illiterate. Um, obviously, my mum was a stay-at-home mum with 12 kids. Um, so we heavily relied on the ocean. I, and I think in the late 70s, it started. It got to that point where we couldn't rely on the ocean. So I don't think it's you know like it's fertile at the moment. But I think for us, if we want to be seen as, as leaders in conservation, I think we've got to acknowledge that the time we're living in, and we do most of us do, the place that we're living in, particularly in around Sydney, our geogra geographical location. I think if we want to show leadership and say you know and, and put a really strong message out there about us being, you know, sustainable fishers and conservationists. I think we've got to acknowledge that we've, you know, the time, the times have changed, the goalposts have changed, and, and we have to change our attitudes as well. Thank you. So it must drive you crazy then watching that with the cook care that you take in your local area to see videos like that, dragging nets across the floor. I've, look, I've never thought of that, you know, like I, we do use a net and I think, you know, it's a hand net and, and stuff like that. But that thing, you know, not only the fish that it's taking, the habitats, you know, you know, we, you know, there's seagrass. I notice that the, the floor's bare, you know, and, you know, we know seagrasses and other things are very important. All, all it would take was a couple of rollers on the lead line of the net to improve the situation, but they couldn't be bothered. You know, there's ways to ameliorate the, the impact you saw up there. Yeah, um, the rollers, you'll still catch the fish and you'll, uh, some of the habitat will remain, but they don't want to do it. What we're facing now in communication with people is in this polarisation that so many people have identified. An increasing tendency to see those who disagree with you as n n idiots, fools, yeah. and, and with greater contempt, we particularly see that in the US when they were describing opponents as de demonic eventually by the end. So separate, separates. So it's become increasingly, in my view, important to have a civil discourse where you meet and you recognise your common ground. And surely this is this is an important thing to do with fishers. How much do you have in common when it comes to wanting to preserve the ocean? How much it would annoy someone like um, Rob to see the fact that these guys could put rollers on and say what? How many species? Um, I mean, who actually does do that? For example, the rollers. Well, I've, uh, the Spencer Gulf prawn fishery do it because we have assessed them as sustainable, um, and they they have a, a wonderful system. The prawns are delicious. Um, they're on seagrass. Spencer Gulf, everyone. Yeah, no. If you see them in the shop, um, and they also use a fallow system where they move around to let the seagrass recover, and it costs them a bit more, but you know they can fish into the future. And that's the difference, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so that would be that would be the thing to be there's when we're looking at solutions. Now, Camille, what are some other benefits of marine protected areas? Um, gosh, well, they're a really valuable tool for um, building climate resilience, particularly in the high seas. I mean, um, the the high seas absorb huge amounts of CO two from the atmosphere, deep sea ecosystems. Mm. Um, you know, they're like really really critical carbon sinks. So 
High seas marine protected areas definitely will provide an opportunity, I think, to reimagine how we have done ocean conservation. So almost like a paradigm shift mm -hmm. and I guess, you know, centre diverse voices, centre uh, gender diverse voices, centre indigenous perspectives and knowledge systems and actually move towards more of a relationship of like working with the ocean, understanding the ocean, doing proper environmental impact assessments and moving less towards a, a transactional and extractive relationship with the ocean, which we've had for so long. Yeah. You, you're talking about benefits, but I'm, you're also scaring me here, right? So I, <laughs> what I'd like to do is, is spinning off your question there for all of you, you know, how do you have hope for the future of the ocean? We have hope that we can still do something because, as I, because firstly, we still can. And secondly, we must. And thirdly, again, who does it benefit if we do not? I live on Cabbage Tree Bay, which many people will have swum in. And in well, 2002, it was declared a no-take zone. And from what I understand from people who swam there at the time, it was quite – it was it was not not always murky, but they just it was quite stripped of fish. It was quite barren. I think it was Peter Godfrey Smith, the octopus writer, um, who told me that he used to dive there. And then and now it is absolutely teeming with life. Look, I do have hope, you know, and I, that hope comes from some of the work that we've been doing with researchers. And I know um, Cabbage Tree Bay is the gold star. Mm. But at least at the very minimum, these politicians who are putting in these, making these decisions, to look at that and say, "Well, it's only a pin drop around Sydney." The, you know, we can see what happens there. Why those decision makers haven't looked at that and said, "Okay, well, why aquatic reserves all got different rules and regulations anyway?" Yeah, you know, they're based on the same things. Yeah. So you know, I, I challenged them in Parliament House to be brave, and and if that's a gold star, let's all have the same. Um, you know, situation in those things. Let's all have the same rules and regulations and whatever. And that's a really good. That's a really good spot. I'm sorry, I have to stop you. We we are very close to being out of time. So Camille and Dave, you have to tell us. Oh, I, I have hope too. Ten words or less. <laughs> I, li I like their hope. Um, I mean, you just have to go to a place like Palau. I mean, an amazing large stretch of ocean, which is very well protected, um, and that's that's the hope. And then closer to home, and Robert's already mentioned, and, and Julia, Sydney Harbour. What a, what a story. I started diving in the 70s and it even it went on fire for a while there upstream. So it was in pretty bad shape. No one would dive there. And now the improvements in water quality, yeah, yeah, up at, up at Duck Creek, yeah, the oil, oil slick. Um, and now now with the water quality improved and uh, restoration, Sims University is doing some great restoration in the outer harbour, um, we're seeing uh, life returning and there's over 600 species of fish, etc. in a city that's doubled in size since I started diving. So, you know, that's, that's hope. I definitely have hope. I mean, it's why I do what I do and I, I genuinely enjoy jumping out of bed every morning so that I can go to work and do what I do. Um, we've got these global 30 by, like the global frameworks, like 30 by 30, these global targets that we're all working towards. We've got the High Seas Treaty that we're all working towards. And sure, ratification is slow, we're getting there, but there is political momentum building to get there. And when you hear every day that a new country has ratified that treaty and we are one step closer to being able to implement the treaty, roll up our sleeves and hit go and implement these High Seas MPAs, that gives you hope. Fantastic. Well, we have run out of time, which happened way too fast. We should have done without that intro. Hey, um, now <laughs> this is the first in our Big Blue Ideas series. So we are thrilled that you have all come. Thank you for attending and thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you. Julia. The intro Dave, was great. Robert and Camille. Join me in thanking